The Triple Nickel, an elite group of all-black officers and soldiers, got its start in 1943 at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, these were the days of segregation, Jim Crow laws, and so the military was as racist as society. And so you had virtually an all-black army and an all-white army. Before they became a parachute infantry battalion, these black soldiers were a service company attached to the Airborne School at Fort Benning. They were guarding the gate, patching potholes, cooking, being a service company. They were not soldiering. They were living a separate life from the white troops. They were not allowed in the theater. They had to sit in the back of the bus. They ate in separate dining halls. They had separate clubs on on base. They were led by a man by the name of Walter Morris. Walter Morris took it upon himself to take the troops over to the training grounds where the white troops trained, and he watched them every day do their calisthenics and jump off of uh, towers and so forth. He led his troops over there to say, we're going to, although we're not paratroopers and we may never be paratroopers, we're going to train like paratroopers. There were bets by the white troops that uh, black troops didn't have the internal fortitude to jump out of planes, or you know they didn't have the guts to do the work. So they were betting that these black troops would fail. They didn't. They graduated. This new unit became the 555th Parachute Infantry Battalion, nicknamed the Triple Nickel. The 555th were black from the lowest ranking to the top. The war was coming to an end in Europe, but orders appeared, and the orders were marked classified. So they thought, hooray, we're gonna get a chance to kick Hitler's tail, because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to fight against the world's most prominent racist at the time, even though being treated as second-class citizens in their own country. Their classified orders sent them to Pendleton, Oregon, with the war in Europe winding down, the 555th expected to be sent to the Pacific. But when they reached Oregon, they found that the fight was coming to them. Japan had sent a fleet of hydrogen balloons into the jet stream, meant to deliver firebombs to the United States. And they launched nearly 9,000 of these 33-foot in diameter hydrogen-filled balloons with these bombs underneath. Many ditched in the ocean. You know, some ended up in Mexico, Alaska. Some actually turned around in the jet stream and flew back to Japan. But they launched all of these balloons. The military kept it quiet. There was a problem, though, because a couple of them worked really well. Then another balloon landed in the Tri-Cities at Hanford, in the fuse wires at Hanford. Now, fortunately, it didn't explode, or we wouldn't have Richland, Kennewick, or Hanford. The military fought the firebombs with a campaign called Operation Firefly. The soldiers of the 555th were trained to parachute into steep, wooded terrain, defuse the bombs, and put out fires using picks and shovels. Their compelling story is almost completely unknown. Dr. Bob Bartlett, a retired educator and a veteran, is working to change that. I'm prior military, I was Army Vietnam. My brother was in the Air Force and he was in Thailand in and out of Vietnam the same time I was in Vietnam. I come from a military family. My great, great, great grandfather fought Company K, 127th United States Colored Infantry in the Civil War. My father was a combat medic. His brother was a combat medic. My other uncle, Jim Scott, uh, was a tanker in World War II. I had another uncle that was infantry in World War II. And so I come out of a long line of military, you know, prior military folks. And so I was surrounded as a kid with black veterans, World War II veterans, who never told war stories, as, as you would imagine they would. But they talked about the blatant racism that existed in the military. They talked about riding in the back of the bus behind German prisoners of war who were sitting in the front of the bus. Bob is really the keeper of the story. Bob met filmmaker Chase Ogden in 2016 at the Spokane International Film Festival, also known as SPIF. The two men began talking about the story of the Triple Nickel. I really saw Bob's passion for it. 
Um, and I knew that I could help him bring that to more people. He's done a lot of the research, a lot of the locating those stories and um, helping me write, choosing which pieces of the stories to include in the, in the actual film. Uh, but for the actual like putting together of the film, that was that fell more on my shoulders as that's kind of my expertise and not necessarily what Bob is experienced with. He weaved his magic and submitted the short to various film festivals, like the Big Sky Film Festival over in Montana and a few others. And lo and behold, we were chosen at two of them, Spiff and uh, the Pan-African Film Festival in Los Angeles. And so we're at the short film part of the story right now, and hopeful that someday someone will see this story and think it's as amazing as I think it is, and be willing to help us push it further, uh, push it into a full feature film, because that would be absolutely amazing. We have so many stories that you can't obviously tell in a short film. This is such a Northwest story, and it's a black story. In it. It's an American story. And it's a hard story because there's so much about it that's about race. You know, these men were treated horribly uh, wherever they went. Which is why we titled our documentary Jumping in the Fire. Because they not only jumped into fires, literally, they jumped into the fires of blatant racism. They fought two battles at the same time. So everywhere uh, I have gone, I've never been in a hostile crowd to say, oh, that's a bunch of baloney, or that's not as near as exciting as I thought it would be. It's been to the contrary. People say, my Lord, how come I don't know that story? We need to know that story. We need to know more of that story. If we want to know American history, we need to know more American history. People are hungry to know these hidden stories. It's just that uh, we need to get to a stage now where we can tell it in full. Honestly, I've learned so much in working with Bob that I have just a much greater appreciation for, you know, what people in America go through that don't look like me, that aren't white men. And so that's been incredibly valuable. This is not a project to me. I'm connected to the story through my DNA. My grandchildren, your grandchildren, children from now on need to know this story. And if we don't get it told fairly soon, right, it may never be told.